Up next on Fighterpedia, which well-known Evo champion sleeps nude in an oxygen tent, which he believes will grant him sexual powers? And the Skullgirls incident. What happened? And how many bodies are still being pulled out of the rubble? But first, what the fuck happened? Behind the clusterfuck. Street Fighter, the movie, the game, real battle on film. No, really, what the fuck happened? Don't you dare miss it. And we're back. It's common knowledge that every fighting game franchise has... That one. That every fan is sworn to never acknowledge in any shape, way, or form. They're all part of a secret cabal whose mantra is to bury that one into the deepest, darkest orifices of history so that the track record remains unblemished. Out of all the embarrassed, red-headed stepchildren, Capcom's that one is buried far deeper in the sphincter of time than all others. But tonight, here on Fighterpedia, we're going to be reaching deep inside to drag out that rusted coffin, exposed for the unwilling masses, Jaws agape in horror and confusion. Not unlike an 18-wheel monster truck jackknifing through a downtown school zone, Street Fighter the movie is a gruesome sight that commands your attention, no matter how loud your brain screams, No! It seemed to make sense that Capcom should make a Street Fighter to appeal to the changing tastes of the American gamer. This stratagem proved to be, in industry terms, a butt-shitting clusterfuck. Our story begins with INCREDIBLE TECHNOLOGIES! A young company eager to show their latest fighter in a Chicago trade show, BLOODSTORM. Not much to be said about BLOODSTORM that the title doesn't already implicitly imply. The important thing is that the Capcom Zaibatsu happened to be attending the same event that dark day, and looked at the BLOODSTORM cabinet with the same mild curiosity that Dr. Manhattan would regard, say, a butter churn or a PSP. This led to a moment that will forever be remembered as the most tragic case of cultural misunderstanding. In a binge-drunken, opium-induced haze, a snap decision was made. Incredible technologies are the men who will take Street Fighter into the third chapter. Wait, what, what exactly are you implying? Well, the original intention was to have these guys make Street Fighter 3. Liar! Why, why would I lie about You don't know me? your shit. You know your shit. Fuck you! you don't fuck you! You fuck you! Knowledge battle! Okay. It's showtime! Facing straight! The main reason why the game was so terrible was because A, it was the makers of Bloodstorm and Time Killers. They were given free reign over the creative direction as long as it looked like Mortal Kombat and featured maximum van damage. And C, they had one year to turn the whole thing around. What? The reason why T-Hawk isn't in the game is because even though he was in the movie, they forced all the actors to pose as sprites for the game. And Mr. Rainwater had no spare fucks in his pocket for that shit. Dude cleared his trailer, got the fuck out of Dodge the day he was scheduled to shoot. As of now, the whereabouts of live action T-Hawk are still unknown. <coughs> Eat it! <coughs> Shit, that was good. Uh, Gunlock. Gunlock? Gunlock. Guile's cousin from Saturday Night Slam Masters, if you didn't know. Apparently, in a feeble attempt to tie the Street Fighter universe in closer with the canon of Saturday Night Slam Masters, one of the three new palette swapped bison soldier dudes, Blade, is actually Gunlock. <laughs> Phalong's appearance in both the film and the game was dropped in lieu of Captain Sawada, Capcom's failed attempt at creating a mascot in the mold of Sagata Sanshiro. Phalong still appears in not Shao Kahn's throne room stage. Except that he's played by the same thespian who also played Captain Sawada. Sawada is Phalong! Phalong is Sawada! 
<laughs> yeah, well, the arcade version tried to localize Ken's special move shouts because they could not get the actor to say words like Shoryuken to save his life. Hence... <laughs> Instead of super finished sunburst, my part exploded into oblivion! Fuck your sunburst! It's so do shit in America! Incredible technologies had a vision of what fighters could, nay, must evolve into. This magnum opus was supported by three pillars of gameplay. Slam Master Throws, aka Counter 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 Throws. Regen Moves, that let you recover health by draining Super Meter. And Comeback Moves, aka Stupid Broken Special Moves Unlocked Just Before Dying. Okay. Well, that awesome feature, we have all new, all hype movements. Featuring such classics as Sagat's eye lasers, blades rotating foot blades, Chun Li's bird thing, and Sawada Sapuku blood attack. And also, Balrog could reflect any fireball by just blocking it normally. What? I know the formula for incredible technology combo damage scaling. 1 to half to the power of n minus 1, where n equals the number of hits in the combo. Carry the two, bitch. Was seriously wounded, but the soul still burns. Okay. Shenlong, motherfucker. Back during that nebulous time where Capcom wanted no one in the world to know anything about Street Fighter's plot. They okayed the concept for Shenlong to make his first appearance in a Street Fighter game. I quote, When Shenlong does appear, it will be like God making an appearance. Despite Shenlong, an EGM April Fool's joke having no business being anywhere near Street Fighter canon, the trendsetters at INCREDIBLE TECHNOLOGIES decided that not only was he going to be included, he was going to be blindfolded, have half a dragon arm, and have no blocking animations since he was so godlike that he didn't even need to block. He would dodge and weave that shit. He was the incarnation of the eternal dragon! Yeah. Okay. Okay. No, Chief. Fuck. No. Okay. You win. You are the best from now. Now you see the difference between us. Next on, Behind the Clusterfuck. Despite its hardships, the game was well received worldwide. But was it really well received? Yes, it was. Or was it? The answer lies in the heart. So the arcade game dropped, splashing cold water on the exposed backside of the video game industry. Now, the original roster of the arcade game contained everyone from Super Turbo, save for Dalson, Blanca, DJ, T-Hawk, and Phelong. Akuma was in the game, but not the movie. The home port removes Blade, but adds DJ and Blanca, but still doesn't include Phelong or T-Hawk. But it keeps... No one cares! All hype boners immediately softened. The end result was something that no one would spend a single bison dollar to play. When Capcom Japan laid eyes upon the bloody homunculus that fell upon the festering grounds of the birthing pits, it had finally realized what it had done in the eyes of God. In an attempt to hide its shame, the assets were gathered up and dumped on an unfortunate, unsuspecting team of programmers. The end result was a console port, remastered, rebalanced, and retrofitted into the Super Turbo Engine with EX moves and supers. In the end, they managed to make something that was not as bad as you'd expect, but just as terrible as you'd hope. When you really think about it though, did the existence of this game truly bring about profound sadness? Or was it really a banner? flown from atop the highest battlements, rallying all together for pointing and lulls.